Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order uh, the book challenge hearing regarding the book Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi. Please stand for the flag salute. Thank you. The procedure for this hearing will be, the challenger will be entitled to up to 10 minutes to assert why the challenged material is objectionable and why. Uh, board members may ask the challenger questions. A representative from the school district will then be entitled to up to, up to 10 minutes to outline the challenge procedures that have, occurred to, that have occurred to date, assert how the challenge material complies or does not comply with applicable criteria, and recommend an outcome regarding this material. Board members may, as the district representative questions, ask, excuse me, the, the, the district representative questions. The district representative is Rob Manugian. Uh, permit the challenger up to two minutes to rebuke contentions uh, raised by the district representative. The board may also ask the challenger questions. The board will then permit public comment. Following public comment, the board will make a determination regarding the challenge material. If the board deems that the challenge material does not meet applicable criteria, it can discontinue the use uh, of it for any grade level or any group for which use is inappropriate. At this time, I will open the floor to the challenger if she is present. Thank you. You have 10, up to 10 minutes. And actually, pardon me, before you get started, I just want to make sure if any members of the public want to speak, that cards are in the back and you may hand them to Mrs. Termine over here to my left. Sorry, you may proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you to the board for your time uh, to review the book challenge and to Rob uh, Magoonan, Supervisor of Instructor, uh, Instructional Materials and Library Services for his professional guidance through the established Sarasota County School Board Book Challenge Policy. I'd also like to thank the Committee of Teachers and Parents who engaged in this review and provided their insight. This interaction displays an established process in Sarasota County School District for parents and community members to challenge and find remedy for sensitive, controversial, or inappropriate conduct in our school libraries. Active engagement from parents is important and necessary. If a parent has concerns with resources in our schools, then I encourage them to respectfully adhere to this process designed by the Sarasota County School Board. I come before the board today as a concerned parent to make you aware of materials found in multiple libraries, which are available to students in sixth, through high, sixth grade through high school. As a self-guided resource, incorporating the tenets of critical race theory. This revolutionary dogma is repurposed from its Marxist origin to spark class conflict into the race-based conflict teachings of today, designed for an American audience. Regardless of the focus on class or race, the principles remain the same. Sixth grade through high school are formative years of relationship building, exploration, peer-to-peer -peer engagement, and learning empathy for one another. As children gain those experiences and mature, organic, empathetic discussions and relationships help children to navigate this environment, advocate for themselves and others, and balance complex situations. These tender years are also ripe for indoctrination and theory-based persuasion. The content of this book is of concern due, its to, due to its strongly uh, one-sided perspective use of critical race ideological language and strongly editorialized inferences regarding intent available to children in our schools. The school board using legislative guidance has the ultimate responsibility to determine if this matter is legal and appropriate within our school libraries. As, notice, as noted by other reviewers during the process, they too expressed some concerns about the content within the book and younger students' comprehension. Additionally, reviewers acknowledge the book was written in an editorial style from one perspective, which picked and chose historical facts to fit the author's opinion. 
In effect, this persuades students to a particular point of view inconsistent with the principles of state academic standards. Let us not be fooled. Crit critical race theorists are masters of language construction. These concerns should be explored further as some students in our district struggle with basic on grade level comprehension, much less the ability to decipher common strategies used to evaluate an author's persuasive argument. That, discern that discernment is key for students to compare or to separate opinion from fact, especially when authors intertwine the two in tandem. Controversial topics, discussions, and idea sharing are all healthy and beneficial learning tools towards our shared humanity. When age appropriate, done with proper context on the subject matter, and knowing the author's bias and intent. I look to the elected school board and legal advisors for their guidance related to legislative principles and code to determine adherence to the statutory criteria of this material. As rightfully noted by the reviewers of this book, this book is not included in the instruction materials as outlined in Florida Statute 1006.28.2A. However, the context itself, itself, Marxist origin and age appropriateness as a self-guided resource should be evaluated by this board relative to Florida Statute 1006.28.2B as material used in school libraries. It should also be considered if this book meets the intended definition of supported materials given its accessibility in school libraries, consistent with the principles of individual freedoms outlined in Florida Statute 1003.42.3A through F. This statute reads in part, the legislature acknowledges the fundamental truth that all persons are equal before the law and have inalienable rights. Accordingly, instruction and supporting materials on the topics enumerated in this section must be consistent with the following principles of individual freedom. No person is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously, solely by the virtue of his or her race or sex. No race is inherently superior to another. No person shall be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, disability, or sex. Meritocracy or traits such as a hard work ethic are not racist, but fundamental to the right to pursue happiness and be rewarded for industry. A person by virtue of his or her race or sex does not bear responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. And lastly, a person shall not be instructed that he or she must feel guilt, anguish, or other forms of psychological distress for actions in which he or she played no part, committed in the past by other members of the same sex or race. It's up to this board to determine if these materials found in Sarasota County School Libraries adhere to the legislative guidelines, fundamental truths, and statutes. As parents, guardians, and caregivers, we have a great responsibility to our children to take the opportunity to freely engage with our school system when we need to. Lastly, the school board, again, has the ultimate responsibility to make a decision on the age appropriateness and content of materials available in our school libraries. Whatever the board's final decision produces, we should acknowledge that a process of engagement is available with parents to raise concerns along with the school board. This is not the decision of one person. Rather, it is the conclusion of a democratic engagement of many who have provided insight into this review. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you, uh, board members, do you have any questions or comments for the challenger? Seeing none, I want to thank you for taking the time and coming forward to share your opinion and, as you mentioned, highlight the process. So thank you very thank much. You. Moving on, we will call Mr. Manugian to present the school district's perspective. You also have up to 10 minutes. First, I'd like to thank the board for having me today and, um, of course, convening to uh, discuss this important topic. It is very important. And secondly, I would like to expressly 
Thank you. There you are. Uh, Mrs. Uger and I by now are fast friends. Um, we've been having conversations since May, and I really can't um, thank you enough. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with her through this process. Um, she um, originally contacted us at, in May of last year, and it did fall right at the end of the school year. So um, as our process defines, um, we, um, I contacted the school. Um, she spoke with Mr. DiVerno at um, Venice Middle School. Um, they had a conversation. Um, ultimately, it was decided that they would convene their work group to review the material, um, and, which they did uh, prior to the end of the school year. Uh, and they decided at the school level, their recommendation was that the book be isolated for eighth grade only. Um, I offered that to Mrs. Euchre, and at which point she um, made use of her right to appeal that, uh, and it came back to me, and, and here's where I have to thank her again because I reached out and said, it's the end of the school year, everyone's leaving for the summer, and, and she was wonderful in, in agreeing to, to hold off until the fall, um, and then as you all know, we had a hurricane, uh, then we had another hurricane. So this process has been um, taking place for quite some time. Um, ultimately, we, we did uh, convene a district level work group uh, that I oversaw the work. Again, I, I think it's important to recognize that this process works and that I don't, um, similar to our textbook adoption, um, district staff, we, we don't really have any say. We coordinate, we run the process, we guide and direct Ultimately, it's up to those work groups to, to make a decision and decide um, what they view. That, that work group impressed me. Um, at the school level, I think it's important to say that I don't really have a hand in that. That's done at the school site, so I'm not privy to exactly what happens at those meetings. I just get the results back. Uh, once it comes to the district level, though, um, I am running those meetings. Um, listening to the conversation, uh, providing guidance and advice if, if asked. Uh, the, there were some wonderful conversations in that district work group um, about um, content uh, and, and the age level at which um, that content was um, available to students. I, I would say at, at that time, um, some of the conversation fell to the breakdown between what is considered a self-selected um, reading material and what is viewed as an instructional material. Um, and we did, you know, and I think that's really important. I know uh, Mrs. Euchre mentioned that, but I think it's important for the board um, and everyone else to fully understand that the way we view that instructional material um, versus a self-selected text in a library. And I know that there are statutes and guide guidelines for those self-selected materials as well. Um, however, um, you know, the, the work group seemed to believe that the, the point of view of the appeal was that this was CRT and violated House Bill 7. And forgive me, um, I mix up the sevens as I refer to them. House Bill 7, 1557, and 1467. So House Bill 7 um, related to uh, CRT and, and conversations about race, and that's where we differentiated between because the bill specifically states that those materials used for instruction, and this book um, is not being used for instruction um, in the district. So that, that conversation, I guided them through that conversation. Um, there still were some concerns uh, about age level appropriateness for sixth graders. Ultimately, it was decided that if a sixth grader picked up that book in a self-selected capacity and then got two or three pages into it and had trouble understanding that ultimately they would put the book back and they weren't being directed to read that, that book. Um, so ultimately, the uh, district work group's decision was to have the book remain accessible grade six, 12, where it is already currently available in our district. Um, at that point, I contacted Mrs. Euchre, and she availed herself of her appeal process once again, um, which leads us to today. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, not having seen that process, I've been in this position for um, 10 years. Um, 
and I've been around this. Uh, I served on some committees, district level challenge committees. Nothing is, in my time has ever risen to the level of a board um, challenge. It, it is wonderful to see the process at work and, and, and be proud of the way it works, knowing on both sides that, that parents and citizens have the right to avail themselves of that process. And then, you know, I, the professionalism that I saw and witnessed from our teachers and staff and having real conversations about those. It wasn't just closed-minded. We met and met for nearly two hours while they, they hashed it out um, the, the, best, the best they could. So, you know, at that point, uh, that, that's an overview of how the process um, runs essentially here. Um, I don't know if at this point you have questions for me uh, that pertain to that process, but I would be happy to answer. Uh, thank you so much. Do members of the board have any comments or questions for Mr. Manugian, Mrs. Rose, and then I have Mr. Edwards. I have a question relative, uh, Mr. Manugian, to, um, first off, I just want to say thank you for um, all the work that you and your team, Mrs. Meckler, and, and so forth and so on, have done on this. I very much appreciate it. My question is under the uh, non-instructional materials criteria and it states that a, a book self-select should be without bias or indoctrination. Um, are you confident, you and your team, that this particular book doesn't contain bias or indoctrination? Are you asking me, per, just to clarify, are you asking me personally or in professionally in uh, our conversations? Professionally. Okay. So I, professionally, course. those conversations that we have had revolve around the fact, outside of this being a self-selected text, revolve around the fact that this, is, this <clears throat> presents clearly a side of an issue. Um, and even the people that um, I have worked with and have read the book in a professional capacity, not weighing in on this, fall on all sides. And though the message may not be one that they necessarily agree with, they also see the value in the fact that this material was presented as a side of an issue and that there will be other sides and other perspectives. And I think it's important that instructional materials and library materials, as, as indicated, I don't have it in front of me, and it's one of the pieces of legislation I don't have memorized. Um, but also require that materials present multiple sides of issues. And that while this book may not be everyone's cup of tea, it does present a side of an issue. And that when read um, as more of an op-ed piece, that there is value in that material. Um, the author states multiple times, this is not a history book. I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but not, not trying to portray this as this is it. everything that happened exactly the way I write it. Um, and I think that, was, that, that is the consensus, that is my consensus from a professional level um, and the consensus of others that have read this material outside the scope of, of the district review process. Because again, I, I don't weigh in on those meetings no one, I, I don't have anything other than to guide and answer questions, provide resources in terms of legislation. So the district level committee was given copies of all the legislation and told to read the book from that perspective. Thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you very much. Mr. Edwards. Thank you. Um, if I understand the process correctly, I think you, you May, and this is what I was told, the original um, process started with the parent and the school only, and the original decision was that the, those parents' child did not, would be prevented from checking out the book. Was that the first decision that was rendered? So I, I can't speak to that specific statement. So, so policy as it, as it stands right now um, puts the onus on the school's principal to originally have a conversation with the parent. 
and, and we, whatever resolution they discuss um, can be accepted at that point. So, you know, I, the thinking for me is, is that that original conversation would include, we understand you're concerned about this material. Um, we can certainly flag your child's library account so that if they go to check this material out, a message will come up that says, parent requests that this book not be circulated to the student. In some cases, that may satisfy the complainant, and they may say, you know what, that's perfect. I didn't realize I could do that. Um, and the process would end there. Um, if, if that conversation um, doesn't reach an amenable conclusion, then it would move to a more formal process, which happens at the school level, which is the school review. And then in this case, the, the recommendation from the school review was that it be relegated to eighth grade only. And, and again, I mean, there's no judgment there in saying that in this case, Mrs. Euchre said, no, I, I, I would like to appeal that um, and move the process further. And then once it hits my level, you know, the, the impacts of that are far reaching because now we're at the district level and now any decision that district committee makes touches all levels. It, it leaves the, the school site and now it touches. Potentially, you know, if, if the district committee were to say, you know what, we believe this book or any book belongs 11th and 12th grade access only or just high schools, that would impact all schools. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question. I appreciate your, your explanation. Mr. Duggan, um, as per our conversations, was the original conversation between the school and the parent, the first, the first recommendation back to the parent was your child will, won't, have to, won't be allowed to check out this book. Does that resolve the issue? Yeah, I don't know specifically what that conversation looked like. The challenger might be able to weigh in. But yes, that would theoretically resolve the situation if that's what occurred. Okay, so my understanding then, I mean, this is what I've, I've been led to believe, that that was the resolution, which to me satisfy, should satisfy a, a, you know, my child, I don't want my child to read this book for all of the reasons that have been described, bias, two sides of the issue, all this, that, the other thing. I don't want my child to read this book. So then that was appealed. And then we convened yet another group of parents and teachers and, and then, and I'm, I'm trying to ascertain and I appreciate your um, commitment to the process, let's say, you and, and your, um, your professionalism to see the process through from, from start to finish through two hurricanes, two school terms, <laughs> all of that, and to keep the ball moving along. So I, I appreciate that. But so then we have a second panel who have to read the book, who have to get involved. And the decision was, okay, how about if we just allow eighth graders and, and above to read the book and then that decision was appealed? Is that, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so the first part would have been the conversation with administration. The second part technically would be the school-based process that I think you're referencing and then the appeal which moves it to my level. I mean, my level more formally than just hey, we have a parent who's concerned, how do we do this, right. which comes out of the school. So, um, And if you had to take a guess about how many hours you, Mrs. Meckler, the principal, teachers, had to be involved in this, this process, could you take a, just a ballpark? So, so I, though I'm... Self-preservation here. So, so, so I'm certainly There's no not, right or wrong answer. No, no. I, so I'm certainly not, I don't want to stand up here and say, oh, it's a light lift on my part. Have at it. You know, I just, you know, but at the same time, my, my role is, is somewhat limited, right? I, I read the book. I, I read the book because I want to, and I, and I want to get a better understanding. Um, you know, from the school-based committee, you know, we we kind of stretch it out over three weeks. You know, we, we have to pull people together. Um, you know, that takes sometimes a little bit of time because teachers are doing this voluntarily 
parents are doing this voluntarily. Um, and then it's a matter of giving them a reasonable amount of time, because you can imagine a teacher's workload, anybody's workload in general, without saying here, you know, you're not necessarily reading this book for pleasure because you want to, but you're being asked to. So, you know, however long it takes to read the, the book and then convene a meeting and, and have a meeting. So, so we have a meeting at the onset, um, an hour or so, just to, I can lay down the ground rules, provide any documentation that they may need or want, um, and then, you know, however long it takes to read the book and then reconvene and that meeting goes until we have an opinion to, to provide. Um, so that can go, I mean, in the case of the district committee, it went almost two hours, you know, I mean, with conversation. So I, I, I don't know how you ballpark that in terms of, you know, it didn't take, it took a month, but it wasn't a month wasn't full a of month work. Of it's not a month, it's okay. not a month of work. <clears throat> Mr. Duggan, um, I'm also under the impression through my inquiries that um, the expense the school district has incurred around stamped is around $20,000. Um, it's not firm, uh, as uh, here's the final number, but it's a ballpark number that was given to me. Does that sound about right to you? Uh, well, I can't talk to the entire district. I can tell you that at least as far as my review of it, I was asked by one of your colleagues to read it. It took me six or seven hours to read the book. Um, it's about 250 pages. The copy I had, 250, 260 pages. Pretty big font, but I had to labor a little bit through it, frankly, because of it's pretty dense uh, content. Um, I did that this past weekend. So, you know, obviously my hourly rate is what that is for that amount of time. Um, you know, prior to putting these materials together, it probably was another... Um, five or six hours. Um, you know, I had some meetings with uh, Mr. Runoff, the acting superintendent. I've had various discussions with Mr. Mnuchin throughout this entire process to make sure that he had the proper legal guidance and knew what the proper statutes were. Um, and really, um, these statutes jump around, as you all know, from reading the materials I put together for you. So I don't know. I probably have all in on this from a legal standpoint, uh, 11 or 12 hours, I would say, total. Um, maybe 15, somewhere in that ballpark at my hourly rate. So I'd say that would be around $5,000 for just my involvement, very, very roughly. Okay, thank you. Um, and lastly, um, what I'm, I, I want to try and get to is that I, I just really appreciate what you said about um, it's the other side of an issue. Um, I also um, spent time with the book, and um, I think the public sentiment that I have gotten from parents is that they appreciate the school district's concern in terms of um, making sure their children have the opportunity to examine both sides of an issue and to research when possible both sides of an issue and that that in turn leads to critical thinking. So um, I just want to uh, close with that for now um, and I appreciate all of your time, all of your effort and uh, the team uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Marinelli, I got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for all the hard work. I have a question. Can you please explain how um, the team or anybody decides what is age appropriate for a student to read? So, I, excellent question, and I don't know how, how great of an answer I can give you, to be honest with you, right? So, um, you know, in considering we were presented with a unique challenge here. And in that challenge that I expressed to Mrs. Euchre as well was this process started before legislation became law on July 1, 1467, and, and other pieces of legislation guiding those things. And that's not to excuse it away, but when we started the process, I communicated with district staff, I communicated with Mrs. Euchre that we would be starting this process using the policies and what we had in front of us when the challenge was, was started. Um, 
you know, to determine what is age and grade level appropriate, we have some resources, right? We, we try to consult, and we did, and I asked them to, right? Consult um, professional review sites. I mean, that's echoed in law now and required of district media specialists to do, but consult, you know, get those recommendations from sources, um, whether crowdsourced, whether professional review sites that made age recommendations. Um, one of the, again, another unique factor with this book is there are three versions of this book. Mm -hmm. There is an elementary version. There is a, what I would call a secondary version, which is the book before you. And, and there is the original publication, which I would say marketed in as much as I don't like using the term because it has weird connotations. Um, it's an adult book. Um, so, you know, it, it, the decisions are based on those teachers and, and their point of view from the students they serve and the students they teach. That's my opinion. I mean, no one's telling them, well, this book was written for. So you would have teachers or staff make the argument that if they're serving a gifted population, those kids can comprehend content at a higher level. Well, that, that is true. It also, we also then have to have the conversation about content appropriateness for those students as well. So yes, they can absorb more maybe. Um, but so this, this book fell into that gray area and we had the school principal that served on the district committee who raised concerns about the accessibility of this text for younger kids, sixth graders. And it wasn't that he found or anyone on the committee necessarily found it inappropriate, it was just the density of the content. So you heard Mr. Duggan say, it's pretty dense. It's, it can be pretty dense. And again, I, I go back to what continued to come up through this process. This is a self-selected text. And if I can step outside of my professional self for a second and say if I were in sixth grade and I pulled this book off the shelf, I probably would have gotten about 10 pages in and I would have gone, put it back on the shelf. So, I mean, that, that, that's why I think it's so important that, yes, we do bear a responsibility to provide students with content that is appropriate. But at the same time, we need wide and varied content and self-selected text that they have the right to put back. So we afford our students especially young students, they have, and I'm not saying right or wrong, right? They have very few. Their lives are, are controlled as they should be and manipulated by their parents and adults in their lives. If going to the library and choosing a book that they want is a little bit of freedom for those kids, then I view that as very important. Well, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. No, no. Just no, because I, this comes up. Yes. And as a former teacher, I've had to answer that Kind of like you did, because there's it's a very gray area. But I read the book too, and and I agree it was, it was a difficult read, uh, as far as the density of it. I thought the same thing. If I taught middle school, I know my kids would have put it back on the shelf because they they want to most want to enjoy it. Not to say that's not enjoyable for all, but that's that was that's a hard read, because of the the density of it and the way it's written. So thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Duggan. Yeah, I just wanna to add to that point. When this process started was prior to the legislation, typically the legislature will pass a bill and then the administrative agency, in this case, the Department of Education will issue guidance on what the legislation means. Um, I just wanna point out that after the school-based and district-based process concluded, the Department of Education did put out factors regarding what is considered age and grade appropriate, which are included in your materials. But just to be clear, those were not available to Mr. Mnuchin uh, or to the school-based process uh, prior to that. I just I wanted to point that out for clarity. Thank you. Um, well, first, I want to thank you, Mr. Manuvian. I think that I said this over the past, particularly the last year or so, you, this, you've had a very challenging, you've had the helm of a very challenging year, um, but a very important role. And something that you've said, and I really I want to underscore that, is 
through this this process is really, really important. And the way in grace that both you and the challenger have approached it, I really want to commend you all for that. I know that in with Mr. Renoff and even Mr. Duggan and myself, it has afforded, and even in my home in, and with other people in the community, has afforded a very healthy dialogue of where is this the appropriate level? What What is our role in this matter? And how do we balance the multitude of scales? Because I believe that is genuinely where everyone wants to find ourselves. And, and when I think about the, what this journey this last year in particular has looked like when it comes to evaluating the current books that we have on there and that demand. But there has always been a process to allow a parent or a member of our community, whether or not they have a, a, a child in our school district, to bring forward a challenge of, of instructional material as well as library books. And that's been the case for a while. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that because that, that's not new. Um, and I think that's important because it's an engaging our community who is a stakeholder in the public education system that we have and are a, um, a part of the funding process. So I want to implore everyone that that is something we welcome. And if you look at this as an example, it's a healthy discussion and we figure out where we go. Um, one of the questions I have is um, when, let, starting with the, the books entering into the library book, do we know when this book entered into our circulation? I didn't check every copy. It seemed that most copies entered about 2019, 2019. Uh, when they were added to the system. Okay. So. And, and something that, because when I read it, it is, uh, well, and I, a lot of the things that you hi highlighted is, is that it is very clearly one-sided, and it's, it doesn't dim dismiss um, the, the narration, really is, underscores that this is that perspective. Um, and overarching, I think, you know, when we, we'll get to age appropriateness and context in, in, a, in a moment, but over, overall, it's, it's very clear that it's one-sided, and I think there's many Betty books and, and different material that we'll have that are, are going to offer a one-sided vantage point, um, and that's healthy to know that this is one side. As long as the, the reader is understanding that that is, in fact, with context, this is a one-sided vantage point that's not necessarily the whole fact. And you would benefit from seeing another perspective, even if it is self-selection. So when you see a book like this in 2019, it's not, you know, this has kind of been this hot topic, if you will, for lack of a better term, with CRT and anti-racism and what have you. Um, do we, when we add a book like this, um, do we look at something like a counter perspective as in entering in the circulation to balance it? Well, look, just as a point of clarification, and I continually forget this. So this was a Sunshine State Young Readers Award winner. Um, Wait, and for the audience and for everyone, what specifically, can you clarify what that means? So the fame sponsors, they're, the organizations in the state get together and they provide um, reviews and lists of books at varying levels, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and then Florida Teens Read is the high school version of that. Um, and that is sponsored by FAME, and what, what they do, and, and you can see this posted everywhere, and, and we, kind, we try to make sure that message is heard. FAME explicitly states these books are intended for self-selected reading and not designed to be used as pieces of instruction. So that I just I'm going on the disclaimer for fame, right? So so just so that's out there, right? They they put out these award winners, and as a matter of course, we have over the years purchased a set schools and schools buy those sets of books huh. for their students. So. Uh, I, this may not be a fair question for you, but when you say it like that, are they? Are they? Is it arguable that these this package of books year over year are with they're clearly identified as not to be uh, no, no and, instructional and material, and they're solely self selection? Like having having conversations with people in fame and and past presidents and current presidents in fame, their their goal is promote to promote the love of reading, and and they're they're in the joy of reading. And the thinking there is to differentiate between what a teacher or an instructor may require them to read as much as a student may enjoy it versus a student going to a shelf and going, that looks really cool. I want to read that and pulling it off and sitting at home on their own or wherever, reading it at, on their own versus, okay, here's the book that we're reading now. And again, regardless of how much the students may enjoy that, they know I have two weeks to read this book, and I have to write a book report, or I'm going to take this test on this book. So they just they go out of their way to make sure, like these books are out. We're we're publishing these these lists for students to find a book that they love, 
Um, you know, and I would tell you, and I'm, I'm going to, I have the opportunity and the microphone's in front of me. Um, <laughs> Seize it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm one of those kids. I'm not a kid anymore. But I'm one of those kids that found books and read everything. My, my father finished his education in eighth grade. My mother is 90. My father, up until the time he passed away, they read a book a week. I was never, never. No one ever said, don't read that. Mm -hmm. Can't read that. I mean, and I'm not making the argument. I'm just saying. So as a teacher and somebody involved in education, there's nothing to me more powerful than a kid finding a kid who may be isolated, marginalized, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. A kid seeing themselves in a piece of text and going, huh, somebody else thinks, feels, acts, does the way I do. So, so I just, you know, <laughs> thank you, but that's not, that, that's not, you know, I, again, I had that opportunity, so, you know, when we, when we have these conversations, the opportunity to, to remain neutral in that, with that understanding, and, and have that conversation with people who may feel differently, and that's fine. But when we talk about fame, I guess that's why I was so emphatic gotcha. that that's why those books are there. That's why those books are there. No, I appreciate it, and thank you for that clarification, because I'm familiar with Sunshine State Standards, or not to, uh, readers, excuse me, but, and so when we do a package like that, when we, uh, it, we still vet that package, right? I mean, they're usually, they have these recommendations of here's a series of books for this year, and then our processes will pick the ones that we believe work for our district, right? Not, not as formally as it will be moving forward with 1467. <laughs> I mean, that's just the no, reality no. of it, right? Okay. So, so, you know, with the understanding that, that books like that, and that, and that really is um, at, at the district level, about the only time we do something like that. And, and, and the lift in providing those books for schools was more financial than anything else mm -hmm. to say, you know, this is important and we want these books because schools, you know, built competitions around the kids reading them and promoted them. And, and you know, when we have, you know, our, our, li our wonderful library texts in our schools, but there's a wide and varied knowledge base there, and it helps them focus on here's something you can do in a, in a package, right? Here's, here's the, here are these award-winning books um, that were voted on by students and teachers and people all over the state, so. Gotcha. No, thank you for that. Um, one thing, I have a couple of questions here, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Duggan. Um, you mentioned, and I, I know that this was a, the, the middle level, if you will, for, compared to the initial adult version. There's an elementary version. I didn't know that. Is that, do we have the elementary version in our school district? I'd have to, I, I haven't, my focus, I haven't checked. I would have to check. I, I honestly don't know. Okay. Um, and then to Mr., thank you very much. For, to Mr. Duggan, um, so I know that the statute and evaluating instructional material versus self-selection, um, and can you walk us through that process as comparison? Um, because I think that the newer language, there is some areas where it's, how they define it, and I want to make sure we're walking the appropriate line. So can you walk us through that evaluation? Sure. So Florida Statute 1006.2a sub 2a uh, creates um, two different sets of criteria for challenging a book. Um, you heard the challenger earlier today reference 2b for self-select library material. So there's one set of standards for what's called instructional material, core instructional material. That's things like textbooks, required readings, things that strongly coincide with the classroom instruction. And it is a more, I would describe as a more stringent standard for um, you know, what uh, the state mandates that we instruct a student upon, every student. There is a more permissive standard for um, self-selected library materials and classroom books um, which prior to recently have not been uh, heavily regulated um, with more recent regulation are now more so regulated and there is a more permissive standard for self-select library materials um, and so getting that determination right of whether this is an instructional material or a library material really dictates what set of criteria you would apply to this particular book. 
Um, and recently, FDLE, or I'm sorry, FDOE, the Florida Department of Education, has issued um, a proposed administrative rule that actually becomes effective in February and has issued some guidance and some training to give more clarity about what factors are to be considered for self-selected library materials. And part of the legislation that passed in July, um, Mr. Mnuchin and, and Ms. Meckler and her team um, you know, are tasked with going through the entire um, library and all of the classrooms and all of the libraries and the schools and applying the criteria uh, in the statute to all of the books we have in this uh, school district. Thank you. And so because I know, and again, one of the first questions I asked, given the timeline of this and understanding what transpired legislatively and then rulemaking and then the you know, timeline being right in the middle of it, um, recognizing, and I'm glad you highlighted that, that this was applied to the initial policy and the stand and the prior statutory language. But now that we're kind of in this transfer over time with more explicit directions and even that it's not formally a rule that it's adopted yet, I would have we put this particular book now up against the that standard um, that will likely be approved by the Department of Education from a library selection evaluate. Go ahead. So I can tell you that when the district, even though we started the process in terms of what our local board policy was, um, my guidance to the district work group was I provided them with copies of House Bill 7, 1557, and 1467 and asked them to evaluate this material measured up against those to determine. And I, I believe you may have that somewhere. Yes. Okay, what I provided the committee. So I, I just want to clarify that point. So in terms of looking at it against current law, as current as possible when we did the review, I, I believe that was done. No, I, I, I appreciate that. Okay. These are the questions we get from many out I, there. So okay. yes, and thank you. Um, I, so for most of my questions have been answered. I have additional thoughts, but I certainly want to get to public comment. Are there any other questions for Mr. Duggan or Mr. Manugian by the board? Mrs. Rose. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, would like uh, legal counsel from um, uh, the most objective perspective that we have and the new legislation, even that that hasn't been passed yet. Um, are, does this, is this book in compliance from your legal standpoint, having done the research and work that you've done? Okay, so my opinion is if this was an instructional material, it would probably not pass the legal scrutiny required of instructional materials as the way the state defines them. Um, importantly, and this is something I just learned today, if this book was acquired in 2019, that would have been prior to the state rules changes regarding required instruction. So it would have, if it was instructional material, it would have at the time of acquisition been in compliance. Since then, a rule has been passed that would make it prohibited. Um, as far as being a library of material, um, I don't think it contains pornography. I think it's an open question and arguable both ways, whether it's age and grade appropriate based on the most recent criteria provided by the Florida Department of Education. And I think it probably likely is suited to the needs of the student, um, you know, if it is age and grade appropriate. So. Um, I think you could make an argument either way, whether it meets the criteria or not. I really think that this is a uh, very tough case um, with this book right on the edge of um, permissibility or not. Uh, clarification, please. Um, from your legal uh, opinion, you're saying that the gray area is in the age and grade level appropriateness? Yes, that's what I think. Um, and I think just the factor that was a question earlier today is you know, whether it is uh, with bias or indoctrination, it certainly is a persuasive piece. Um, not unlike most books, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 I would describe it as a, uh, in my own words, in one sentence would be a history of, uh, you know, systemic discrimination against African Americans in a way that disadvantaged them and uh, approaches uh, how to overcome that. Um, and they kind of talk a lot about uh, what's called an anti-racist approach being preferable to a, a similist approach or a segregationist approach. Um, it really is, even though they call it throughout the book, not a history book, really a history of systemic racism against African Americans. Um, so I do think that that 
would be within the definition of critical race theory as the Department of Education has since we acquired this book defined it. And I think that that rule applies to instructional materials um, and would be prohibited under that. But um, as a self-selected library material, I think it turns on whether um, it is without bias or indoctrination. And I think many people would have many different opinions on that. I don't know that there is a right or wrong answer to that. Um, and that really is, is the issue here, is I think it's right on the edge of, of whether it does that. It certainly is persuasive. Um, I don't know if it quite gets to bias and indoctrination, frankly, is my opinion. But that's just my opinion. And I think reasonable people would, would differ on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no more comments or questions, Mrs. Termine, do we have any comment cards? Oh, pardon me. I'm sorry. I, I, I need to go to my cheat sheet. This is the first one we've done. I think anyone up here has done, so I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manugan, thank you so much for your um, valuable insight. Um, I now will call up the challenger uh, to offer any rebuttal, and you will have up to two minutes to do so. And my apologies. Just getting prepared. <laughs> it's never, never easy being the first first one. And Rob, thank you. It was great to actually meet you in person. So um, I just, again, want to express like my gratitude for um, the professionalism, the guidance, um, that Rob has shown through this and um, your willingness to hear this. Um, I did want to make one clarification. Um, Mr. Edwards had asked about, um, you know, did I, did I talk to the principal? Um, I don't actually recall that I actually talked to him. We talked about um, that there was, you know, I could, you know, m make sure that my child didn't take it out, which is fine. I'll just, for full disclosure, my child has read this book. Um, we do a book club and we discuss you know, books. And so that's kind of how this, and this is actually two years ago, so I've read it actually three times. So maybe I'm up to like 15 grand on, um, <laughs> on analysis. Um, and, you know, again, I just want to clarify that we have a process in place, and I'm very thankful for that. I think this is healthy um, discussion about what's appropriate in our school districts. This is not about banning books. It's not starting bonfires in the middle of the, you know, of the of the courtyard of things that we don't agree with. This is about age appropriateness. This is about understanding the impact within our society, within our children, within their interaction, and also their emotional well-being to take that information in, um, as well as interest. Um, I think you know we're all humans, and we understand that, you know, we've been in this really crazy world for about three years-ish, right? And, you know, nobody likes to talk about race. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't mind. I grew up in a, people, a lot of people that didn't look like me has, you know, different, um, you know, different languages, all of that. So it's not an, not an issue or a hard discussion to talk about. What I do think that we want to make sure that it's age appropriate. We do want to make sure that um, there's some guidance too um, in that. So, I just wanted to, again to say I really love this process. Um, not that I, you know, want to come up every month and do this, um, but I do really appreciate that um, you all took the time, the effort, um, and you know, the interest to be here today. So thank you. Thank you very much. Now, members of the board, we have 20 comment cards. We usually have three minutes for comments. We have a hard stop at 2 o'clock. Um, this is unusual. We actually added um, to air. We, initially, it was scheduled for one hour, but we were, did not believe that would be a, afforded enough time, which I'm glad we didn't. So um, I made a suggestion that we move it to two minutes so we can get through every single individual and afford ourselves the opportunity to finalize uh, and conclude this, giving us the next time for our, because um, we have a scheduled executive session uh, with the attorney. So is that, um, are there any objections to moving it to two minutes so that every person can speak um, and we'll allow ourselves to conclude. Mr. Edwards, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to object on, to that because um, I was <laughs> the proponent of public comments being at two minutes, um, and this board has taken it and moved it to the other direction. Um, what that is saying to me is that in every public uh, topic that this board would then decide if it's two minutes or three minutes. And I think since this board has advertised three minutes and um, in general and wants comments to be three minutes, whether we're here for until whenever, then that's what it takes. So that's just my opinion. 
Thank you for that. No, I appreciate that, and I did con uh, consider that. However, at the same time, thank you. I do obviously have a history of supporting public comment, but I also want to make sure this is a little bit different than our usual public comment. Um, the alternative would be we suspend and we do not conclude today. So I'm going to actually move that we uh, afford each speaker two minutes so we don't take any additional time. I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Are there any comments? Uh, members, can we please vote? Mrs. Marinelli? Mrs. Uh, Mr. Edwards? No. Uh, Mrs. Rose? Yes. Mr. Enos? Yes. And the chair votes aye and the motion passes to afford each speaker two minutes, four to one. So starting with the first speaker, we'll have Mrs. Uh, Robin Williams, and then after that, Lila Newcomb. As a Jew, it's chilling to me that you're considering the banning of stamped. It's an excellent addition to any middle or high school library and frankly should be part of the curricula dealing with American history. It's written in an engaging style that holds the attention of teenagers interested in uncensored history. It challenges readers to question and reconsider their assumptions. It shows that people can change with new information and by examining and reflecting upon different viewpoints, including some of the historical figures the book discusses, like W.E.B. Du Bois. It's an eye-opener and is precisely the kind of book that helps students' intellectual growth. It poses important questions. Students need to read different viewpoints and learn how to think critically. To flourish in our world, students require broad educational opportunities that shouldn't be stifled because of the objections of some narrow-minded people. Those individuals already can write a note directing the school to prevent their child from accessing a particular book. That doesn't give them the right to deny the book to other people children and limit their education. They can parent their own children, not everyone else's. This is supposed to be the freedom state. Remember, freedom for all, not just a few. One Holocaust survivor speaking with me this week about the potential stamp book ban said it brought to mind the prophetic words written in 1822 by the great German Jewish poet Heinrich Heine, where they burn books, they will in the end burn human beings too. A hundred years later, in 1933, the Nazis banned and then burned books. Whether or not humans wind up burned to death, we're already seeing a dramatic increase in hate crimes against the Jewish, LGBTQ, and other minority communities, resulting from the empowerment of bigots in the wake of Florida's anti-woke book ban and anti-gay legislation. In the same year the Nazis banned books, they took control of universities, starting with the hostile takeover of the university known for its liberalism and creativity, Frankfurt University, and then rolling over academia throughout Germany. The point of Holocaust education is to be able to connect the dots from the past, to see the warning signs today, and do something about it before it's too late. When you couple Florida's book bans with last week's hostile takeover of New College, one would need blinders on not to see the danger signs. Don't politicize our children's education. Don't ban books. Thank you very much. Lila Newcomb and C Cynthia Plug. Um, may I, thank you very much. We're actually, I'm going to ask you once, please do jazz hands so we can get through and allow every single person to be heard. Thank you so much. Hi, Leela Newcomb, and I am living grandma of three children in Sarasota Public Schools. And I have uh, really enjoyed the professionalism that I uh, heard today. Uh, and what I was going to say is probably like a super over oversimplified version of everything that's already been presented. So, you know, I guess my only thing is for one parent to continually try to rule what everybody else's child can or cannot read doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, give everybody uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, P parental rights are one thing, but for one parent to decide for everybody is a serious overstep. That's my, my opinion. I have a sixth grade, one of my three grandchildren, sixth grade gifted, I can guarantee you that she would put the book back in one page uh, because it's just not her interest. The, my older one would probably read it cover to cover, but there has been no harm found in it through the channels that uh, were provided at the level below bringing it to the school board. It wasn't um, found dangerous, it, and it was not found to be against the law. So I just hope you guys will uh, go along with that. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Cynthia, I'm sorry, is it Pilug? And then I have Michael Weddle. I'm, I must not be getting that right, but it... 
Um, I just want to, oh, sorry, Cynthia Flug, and I just wanted to say, uh, Mr. Mnuchin, you've worked hard. <laughs> so um, I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, I don't see a reason why there should be any limitation on the freedom of speech uh, for this author to be presented. Um, it goes against uh, intellectual freedom, which librarians, I think, would want to promote. Um, I don't think there's a reason to violate the uh, American Library Association requirements that we have, you know, to work against any type of censorship, since it didn't violate the laws. And I appreciate the process, which has now since recommended by Teen Reads, that was 14 certified Florida media specialists that recommended the book um, for open, not as an instruction. Then we had the uh, principal meeting, and if I count correctly, uh, at least 22 um, district employees and curriculum specialists that were required to be on the committees to review this. Um, I don't see that uh, overturning it for use by the general public, by the general students, is a good way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Weddle and Lisa Schur. Hello. I'm Dr. Mike Weddle. I'm on the board of directors for the Minnesota Branch Association for the Study of African American Life and Culture. I live in Venice. Where I grew up, everyone looked exactly like me. Uh, and I believe this is a book that Venice parents like myself should want in their library. And I thank the review committee for their due diligence. And I don't agree with everything in this book. But that doesn't mean that I think it has no value. It's written, I found it in a conversational style one person's perspective of what he learned growing up and living in society. I wanted my own children to see things from perspectives outside of their bubble. That's what books do, they help us to learn empathy. I'm a doctor, I had to work with people, all kinds of people, and empathy was a very important skill in my career. If we remove this book, we need to be ready to remove other books. For example, the books of Helen Keller, writing about her experiences and reality that none of us can share and that none of us can, um, can, can know. Who on this board, I don't think anyone on this board is ready to say that one black American's experience is not valid and I don't want, think anyone on this board wants to make decisions about a parent's right to choose what their children can or cannot read. Banning a book in Venice where I live, for me, is targeting white children. I grew up in white society. It's so racialized that it's very easy to remain unaware of one's position in the real world. Education is giving children tools to succeed. A book cannot make a person feel guilty. Let me say that again. There's no book that can make a person feel guilty. But a good book can help a person to learn empathy. And that's what students need to succeed in the world. I think that's why we're all here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lisa Schur and Tallulah Brand. My name is Lisa Schur. I'm a Sarasota County resident and parent of a child who's enrolled in and attends school in the district. I'm here today to voice my opposition to removing the book stamp from the bookshelves of school media centers. I firmly believe that each parent, and I have huge respect for Mrs. Euchre, I believe that each parent has the right and the responsibility to determine the reading materials that they wish their child to access in the school library. But they do not have the right to determine what materials that my child may access or read. As most parents already know, the school district maintains a database of all books available in each school's media center. Any parent who has concerns about the reading materials available to their child may flag those books that they do not wish their child to read. This is a remedy which allows the complainant to exercise her parental rights while at the same time not infringing upon the rights of other parents. Instead, we're here today to hear whether the board will remove a book from the media center curtailing the parental rights of myself and other parents when a remedy already exists that will let the challenger exercise her parental rights. To proceed with the removal of this book is a violation of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution and flies in the face of well-settled case law, which is higher than state statute. In 1982, the Supreme Court decided Board of Education versus PICO. In that case, a school board had rejected the recommendations of a committee of parents and school staff that it had appointed to review certain books, much like the current 
book challenge procedure that we have here. The court held local school boards may not remove books from school libraries simply because they dislike the ideas contained in those books and seek by their removal to prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion. In the PICO case, the court relied on the previous decision in Tinker versus Des Moines School District and stated that local schools have broad discretion, but the discretion must be exercised in a manner that comports with the transcendent imperatives of the First Thank Amendment. Thank you. I just tried to wait till you finish that sentence. Thank you. Tallulah Brand. Oop. Tallulah Brand and Kia Brand. Hi, my name is Tallulah Brand. I'm a student at Booker Middle School. I asked to be here because I think it's ridiculous for Stamp to be banned, considering the reason, racism. You want to ban a book saying racism isn't right, and your reason is that this book is racist? <laughs> we can't start banning books just because one person has an issue with it. At this rate, we won't have any books left. Happy Black History Month. Now let's ban a book saying racism is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Kia Brand and Nancy McGillory. It's actually Kaya. Sorry. That's okay. I'm Kaya Brand. I'm a Sarasota County resident and have a child that attends a Sarasota County Middle School. As <laughs> Banning books is censorship and against students' First Amendment rights. The Supreme Court has decided this very issue and concluded school officials' removal of books for the purpose of restricting access to the political ideas or social perspectives discussed in them when that action is motivated simply by the official's dis disapproval of the ideas involved was a violation of the First Amendment. A parent in the district has asked that a book be removed because she finds that there's CRT in that book. Removing one book discussing racism doesn't make racism go away. The book stamped racism, anti-racism, anti-racism and you tackles the difficult topics of slavery, racism, and how racist viewpoints have shaped America. This book has been adapted for 6th to 12th grades by award-winning and best-selling YA author Jason Reynolds. It covers top, tough topics engaging kids that read the book to start conversations and thoughts of what they can do to combat racism. Since the book is a self-selected library book, it doesn't fall under House Bill 7 and can't be used as a reason to remove the book. One of the biggest problems I have is one parent is trying to make the decision for what book should be available in the district's library. The parent just mentioned that her child read the book, so why should she take that right away from my child? Where do we draw the line and where, what parents get to decide for the rest? The parent was given the option to limit her child's access to the book, just like every parent in the district is able to do. I am perfectly capable of making the decision for my child, and I definitely do not need help with that. As the author Jason Reynolds once said, books don't brainwash. They represent ideas. You have a right to disagree with those ideas. Adults aren't afraid of books. They're afraid of the conversations. Thank you. Nancy McElroy, uh, Joan Stoughtonborough. Good afternoon. Thank you all for taking the time. And Tom, thank you for trying to get us three minutes. Um, I'm a retired high school counselor, but I also worked at a middle school and an elementary school. Um, spent a long, long time doing that. My mother was a high school English teacher. I grew up like you did. I, re I still read a book a week. And it's a wide variety of books. And I'm not going to bore everybody too much, I hope. Um, but I have a few quotes, because that's what I do. I research. And I realize we're not talking about censorship or banning books, plural. But we are talking about banning a single book, because a single parent has decided it's inappropriate. As far as age appropriateness, I think children know when it's age appropriate, if they read the book and understand it. And this book was written for teens, and I think teens can handle it. Censorship is the child of fear and the father of ignorance. Lori Hulse Anderson. There are worse crimes than burning books. One of them is not reading them. Joseph Brodsky. Any book worth banning is a book worth reading. Isaac Asimov. 
If a public school were to remove every book because it contains one word deemed objectionable to some parent, then there would be no books at all in our public libraries. Peter Shear. Banning books gives us silence when we need speech. It closes our ears when we need to listen. It makes us blind when we need sight. Stephen Chopsky. Censorship is telling a man he can't have a steak just because a baby can't chew it. Mark Twain. <laughs> if this nation is to be wise as well as strong, if we are to achieve our destiny, then we need more new ideas for more wise people reading more good books in more public libraries. Th this is John Kennedy. I'm going to finish Thank you. Him. These John libraries should be open to all except the censor. We must know all the facts and hear all the alternatives and listen to all the criticisms. Thank Let you. Us I'm sorry. I need to be fair to everyone. Joan Statenberg, Burrow, and Janice Blowers. Ma'am, I'm sorry. That's very unfair to everyone else behind you. If you could please let us go. Thank you. Joan Stoutenboro, we live in Osprey. Uh, I'm a retired public school educator, a teacher, and an administrator. I'm a mom, a grandma, and I'm an avid reader of many different genres. A couple of points that have hit me from other comments made. Um, CRT, critical race theory, is not a public school subject ever taught anywhere. It is a law school second year class as far as I can tell. I also am noting that we have a room full of mostly white people making decisions about what is the study of racism, whether it is appropriate or not. Um, in general, I think one parent doesn't have the right to prevent 40,000 other students from access to a book. If you don't want to read it, don't. It's very simple, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Janice Blowers and uh, Mary Alice Mulligan. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Janice Blowers. I'm a Sarasota County resident and parent. Uh, both of my kids are out of the county schools now, um, but graduated from what was once a beautiful and hopefully will continue to be a beautiful and vibrant school district. My oldest child was valedictorian of her class. She went on to become a double Ivy and she consistently brought home as a part of her curriculum, not as a part of self-selected, but as a part of curriculum, things that were difficult, things that we did talk about. So I'm not really here to talk about whether or not a tween version of the, a book about understanding how racism operates is CRT. As the prior woman said, it is not. Critical race theory is something you will find in a graduate school program. I guarantee you no one is teaching CRT in our middle schools. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. We don't have the manpower. Anyway, um, it, it sounds like this didn't even violate the rule, honestly. It was a self-select, not a curriculum. So not sure why we're here. But as we have been here, I'm a little concerned to hear questions about, well, who vets the fame package? It's a selection of books for public school libraries vetted by Florida media specialists and educators. I really don't want to be here next year on a book challenge on a fame book. We want our kids to read. We want our kids to enjoy reading. We, we just can't be going through the libraries. Who's going to go through all these libraries and figure out, is every single book OK? That's, that's just not what we want to spend our money and our time on. Thank you. Mary Alice Mulligan and uh, Marjorie Peter. I gather Mary Alice is not here. Uh, my name is Marjorie Peter. Delighted to hear that so many people read the book. That was my first reaction. Oh my God, they're talking about removing a book. I have to read it. 
Um, I don't remember looking at the issue of race and slavery through the eyes of an agitated, angry black person before. I'm a 74-year-old white grandmother. I need to read more books like this. I'm anxious to discuss it with my grandchildren. And my issue is I certainly don't want them restricted from accessing a book. I applaud the professionalism. You've done your appeals. But to me, once the appeals have been met and answered through school board procedures, then you're kind of at the end of the road. Then you're asking for opinion not based on curriculum standards. You're getting close to book banning, and to me, that doesn't have a good smell. Tread carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah Parker and Caitlin. I can't read that. Uh, Danny Samets. Hi, my name is Sarah Parker. I'm the president of Women's Voices Southwest Florida. I want to echo the Booker Middle School students, say thank you for saying uh, Happy Black History Month. The irony that we're sitting here discussing black books on Black History Month. So I want to start it off with a quote from Malcolm X. Why when all of my ancestors are snake bitten and I'm snake bitten and I warn my children to avoid snakes, what does that snake sound like accusing me of hate teaching? Learning black history and black children learning about their history pivots them further. It's been proven. It help, reading books about black history helps you understand where we came from as people. It would help me stay inside when everybody my age was running the streets and getting in trouble. Being a reader saved my life. You know, one of the things, I read black history and my friends are white, my husband's white, I have mixed children. It didn't make me just hate white people. It made me a strong black woman. It made me want to make my ancestors proud. It helps me educate my friends and my family. I do hear a lot of white parents talking about their white children not being able to read it, but what about the black children not being able to read this? And I just want to say, this book is about generational trauma. Anybody in the room is listening. And I am proud for my people. I am proud to see my people getting further than that general, the general trauma. Black people weren't just taken and sold, they were enslaved, they were raped. Their children were snatched from their mother's arms. Black backs were whipped until some of them died. Black people were bitten and chased down by dogs. Then slavery ended. They were purposefully not educated. America didn't stop there because once they were free, they were lynched and forced to work low wages as sharecroppers. Then we were given voting and that was snatched away too because they made us fear voting. Let's not pretend it was just the government, it was good old white citizens. Does anyone know what year we're at right now going through black history? During that, we were allowed in the same school that children and adults threw rocks. Ford, where were your grandparents and parents during desegregation? What did they do? Were you allowed to bring a person of color home to date? After desegregation, we faced redlining. And just a quick fact, did you know there's still properties on Longboat, Longboat and Lido Key that have into deeds that state you cannot sell black, you cannot sell to black or brown people. You cannot sell that property to black or brown Thank people. Thank you. Martha, uh, whoops, sorry, Caitlin, Danaheim, Samets. Martha Maglian, I'm sorry, Mal Magli Kane. And please correct me if I butcher your name because it seems like I'm doing so. That's okay, you did good. Uh, my name's Katie Danahy Samets. I'm the vice president and founder of Women's Voices at Southwest Florida. And um, so to the, to the best of my understanding, and Madam Chair, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if we can dialogue. But it sounds like this book is not a part of any curriculum that's being taught. Um, the challenge is to ensure that the schools can't carry a single copy of this book that a student could happen to come upon in the library and check out. And if they want to check it out and their parents don't want them to, there's a system in place to keep them from checking that book out. Is, is that correct? Oh, I'm, OK. Well, uh, if, if that is correct, I, I don't fully understand what we're doing here. Um, this seems like a non-issue. Uh, <laughs> and it just it's, it's, it seems like censorship. It sounds like instead of parents wanting to be actively engaged in what their children are reading, they just want to eradicate any other perspective from public education other than their own. Uh, and it sounds a lot like 1933's Germany. And that scares me. I would love to echo the sentiments of every incredible speaker that has come before me today to bring up every single point that can't be ignored. And for those that haven't read the book, I'd like to just read a couple segments. That is what it truly means to think as an anti-racist, to think that there's nothing wrong with black people and to think that racial group groups are equal. 
There are lazy and unwise and harmful individuals of African ancestry, and there are lazy and unwise and harmful individuals of European ancestry. No racial group has ever had a monopoly on any type of human trait or gene. Not now, not never. That doesn't seem like indoctrination. That seems like common sense. And uh, just for the record, on record, Governor DeSantis's lawyer team defined woke as the belief that there are systemic injustices in American society and the need to address them. And that doesn't sound like a radical agenda. That sounds like being a good person. Uh, so with that, please don't ban this book. Thank you. Thank you. Martha Magley Kane, Cynthia Smith. How'd I do on that last name? Did I get it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, obviously for my t-shirt, I have the same few points as most of the other speakers here today. I'm also a 74-year-old grandmother. I have two granddaughters who um, one will soon graduate. Um, I will say that she was accepted at New College and um, won't be attending because of what's going on there. Um, this book, I keep hearing one-sided, this is a one-sided opinion piece, and I felt, when I read it, it was full of inconvenient truths, and truth, nonetheless. Um, we cannot start banning books. I find it terrifying, just the idea of banning books. As was said, um, Mrs. Uker's child has read this book. So I don't understand why that, why, like she said, why this is even being discussed. Um, if her child's read it, why can't my child, if I had one, still in school, um, why can't my uh, junior year granddaughter read it? Um, I will buy it for her and suggest that she read it because it is excellent. Um, I, I just, please don't start this process of banning books because I think, I, I really appreciated what Mr. Duggan said, um, that this book doesn't get to the bias and indoctrination level. Um, and I also wonder, is this decision made just by the members of the school board? That's the, those are the only votes that go towards the banning of this book. Okay, that's scary. Um, <laughs> And when will this decision be made? When will we We don't know? normally when go back and forth, but we are making a decision. We, we conclude today at 2 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia Smith, Elizabeth Barker. <clears throat> okay. My name is Cynthia Smith. I've had... Um, kids in the school system since 2006. We actually moved to this county in 2004 for the schools. Two of my girls have now graduated from Venice High, go Indians, and I now have a second grader. I've been mostly satisfied with my public school experience over the last however many years and have experienced a lot of different perspectives. Um, I'm me, I have my own values, I have the things that I teach my kids. I know when I take, send them to school, they're gonna be exposed to things that I may not always agree with two things that I've experienced over this course of, uh, since I've been in school. In 2009, my then elementary school daughter had to sign a permission slip to view Obama's back to school speech. Not to opt out, but to actually view it. And that was in 2009. And then this, notably this year, this fall, my second grader, I went to a program after school, they worked really hard, they sang a lot of songs, and one of those songs was, um, I'm proud to be an American. Very religious undertones, I'm not religious. I didn't care, my daughter had fun, she was learning about different things. So, with that being said, our school system provides a way for parents to challenge books, but gives them the option to put certain titles on a do not check out list. The book being challenged today is not used as educational or instructional material. It is adapted for our teenagers by Jason Reynolds, a renowned ambassador for young people's literature. It is merely one book amongst thousands available through our public schools to public school students to satisfy their curiosity and expand their knowledge. Our school libraries are not our classrooms. Our classrooms are governed by legislation, but our libraries should be a safe place for people to learn and grow and find different ideas. Any parent 
can censor what their child checks out based on their due diligence. And according to my parental rights, my children are allowed to, outside of classroom or educational experience, have exposure and access to different perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Barker, Christine Herving, Herbig. Hi there. Um, I'm Liz Barker. And I'm the parent of four children, sixth grader, fourth grader, first grader, and a preschooler. Um, and all of them are in Sarasota County Public Schools, so I, you know, invested. Um, and we did choose this district to live in because of the schools. So, you know, so far, we appreciate the quality of education. Um, but I am here to ask the school board to protect my parental rights to choose the books that my children read and that they have a continued access to a wide variety of written material at school. You know, I certainly respect, Ms. Euchre, your coming forward and your concerns, and as a fellow parent, I love that engagement. Um, and I would love to dialogue with you sometime about it. <laughs> we seem like kindred spirits, but, um, you know, I just hope that people will respect my parental rights, too, to choose what's right for my children. Um, and in this case, you know, we went through the process. It does not violate any law. It doesn't, it, it, there's certainly nothing pornographic about it. It's age appropriate. Um, I did read the book cover to cover. I read um, the concerns and I read the committee decisions. Um, and I have to, I agree with the committee. I would like my child to have access to this book. Um, and I think the main thing I want to say is that our country was founded on principles of diversity of opinion, freedom of information, they're cornerstones of our democracy. Our founding fathers established our government based on the ideal of unity in diversity, e pluribus unum, like back from the very beginning. Um, you know, respecting parents and their choices should never infringe on someone else's choices. So banning a book for all students based on one person's preference really does fly in the face of our democratic ideals, and I, I hope you don't. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Christine Hervig and um, Rebecca McConnell. Hi, I'm a um, retired public librarian, and this is, of course, I'm concerned about this. Um, I'm going to read a statement from the Florida Library Association's Freedom to Read um, we support parents' rights to choose materials for their own children, and this right extends to all parents. One parent may not infringe on another parent's right to determine which library materials are appropriate or beneficial for their children. We encourage parents to cooperatively select materials for their children, and we welcome to or, who are and they are welcome to seek help from librarians or library professionals when choosing library materials. Um, when I grew up here in Sarasota. Segregation was just a fact of life, and we were socialized to accept it and expect it, and blacks were socialized to always consider white comfort, um, and sometimes considering that was a matter of life or death for them, to look down or to step off the sidewalk. Thank God that's improved. Um, I am very concerned, being a lifelong Floridian, with uh, the way that uh, DeSantis is politicizing education and history and using our children as pawns in his pursuit of power. And I think that um, being able to say that this something was legislated or this is, this is what the law is, um, when we have uh, people who are using um, the legislative process to manipulate, um, uh, to, to pursue goals that um, are personal and political and not for the good of, of all people in the state uh, is very wrong. And I'm hoping that you don't consider um, banning this book. Everybody needs to read it. And the more reading the kids do, the better for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Rebecca McConnell, David Ford. Hi. I'm a lifelong avid reader. In junior high, I read The Diary of Anne Frank, a book that was written from one-sided perspective. I also read books about slavery, murder mysteries, stories on abduction, the King James Bible, and even Helter Skelter, a book about the Manson family murders in junior high. I've not committed any horrific crimes. I don't have any immense feelings of guilt on behalf of my race, only empathy. 
And despite my varied and interests and sometimes gruesome content, I've turned out to be a thriving and functional member of society. I have a bachelor's degree and I also have an MBA. I own multiple businesses and I have two children currently in public school in Sarasota County, one of which goes to Venice Middle. I send my kids to public school because I trust that the educators have been trained to understand the learning needs and the desires of the kids along with what is appropriate. The book has already undergone a thorough review by these trained educators. Let's trust their judgment and trust the process. Who is this person that has decided that my child should not be allowed to read the book even after her child has written it, or read it? Excuse me, read it. What are your credentials? Why do you feel the need to impose your will on me and my children and all the other children in the county? Why isn't it enough that your child's not allowed to read it? Some of the board members here ran on a platform of parental rights. I am a parent, respect my rights. Respect that our educators are doing their jobs. We trust these people to defend our children during a school shooting. We should trust that they have the educational degrees and wherewithal to understand that this book is just fine in our schools. Book banning is not okay and it is an incredibly slippery slope. Finally, what are we doing here in the middle of the day on a Tuesday? If I didn't own my own businesses, I couldn't take off the four hours driving from Venice, an hour each way, that it takes for me to be here to talk about this. There's a lot of people here and a lot of people that are already here that don't agree with banning this book, but there are a lot of people that weren't able to make it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, David Ford, and that'll be the last speaker. My name is David Ford, and I'm a resident of Sarasota County. We've already heard that it's basically been settled legally, academically. You have an awesome responsibility for the freedom and liberty of the parents of this county. The state prides itself on freedom and liberty. You can send a strong message that you support parents' freedom and liberty to choose what is correct and appropriate for their children. I hope that you will send that message loud and clear that this book will be in the Sarasota County school system. Thank you, and I really hope you make that decision. Thank you very much. That concludes the hearing of citizens. The next item on the agenda is a motion. Is there a motion from the board regarding the challenge material? We have to leave today with a with some kind of action. So <laughs> I will entertain a motion by a member of this board, Mr. Enos. I, I move to go ahead and leave the book in place and from uh, use the representation that we had at the middle school. Uh, I believe it. Uh, the motion would be is to leave it currently as of what is in place um, that we currently have as a standard using the recommendation of both of the committees in regarding to the age appropriateness. I have a motion to maintain the current standing of the book with no additional changes. Is there a second? Sorry, I'm summarizing for the, the is, that, is that an accurate? I don't wanna make your motion for you. So there, I have a motion, is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, are there any comments? Mr. Edwards. Uh, I, Ms. Shuker, I really respect the fact that you utilized uh, the process that is in place and you used it professionally and correctly. And for that, I commend you. Uh, for the policy that we have in place that has that system in place, I think that's a problem because um, I was opposed to that process from the beginning because um, when a parent objects to a particular book, the ability to have that child, or even, quite frankly, an instruction, if it's connected to instruction, if a parent objects to a particular lesson plan, they can object to that and an alternative is presented. And it doesn't affect the whole class, it doesn't affect 46,000 students, it doesn't affect all of what I really perceive to be individual freedom, that the parents have the right, the individual freedom right, to make those choices for their children and that another parent doesn't have the, the right to impose their views on that, uh, that educational outcome for the other uh, student. So I'm, I'm a, but 
we live in a time where the culture wars have impacted, uh, and the, uh, one other thing, the good part of that is, what I loved is um, at the school level, you did engage a really healthy conversation about taking it from eighth grade, or from sixth grade to eighth grade. So there's got to be a forum where people with opposing views can sit down and have healthy discussions that don't really impact or have to go through this process, which is time consuming and expensive. Um, I love that Mrs. Marinelli mentioned age appropriateness because I'm gonna use your, Rob, your uh, the sevens. They're, <laughs> they're kind of confusing, but in the, in the, I think it's 1467, um, I, don't, I don't agree that we should have, be having sexual orientation conversations in K through three, that's wrong. I've never even heard that that happened. I asked that question a thousand times from Sunday and I never got a real response that that happened. But then they slipped in that age appropriate conversation and as per Mrs. Marinelli, Mr. Manugian, it's very gray. No one can define what that means and therefore what we have are school teachers who aren't using school libraries. They aren't using their classroom libraries. They're afraid to discuss sexual orientation because they're afraid they're going to be sued. And at the end of the day, which is what I have been saying all along, it comes back to impact the student and to what I heard today, the love of reading. We heard it all over the place from adults to children that spoke. And so I think that we need to be very cautious and to make sure that our legislature, legislators know that these bills that were passed are having an adverse impact on our student outcomes. And, and I appreciate all of you here making sure that this board knew your feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Marinelli. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do respect all parents and their rights. I am not for book banning at all. But as a constitutional state officer, if indeed we were violating the law, that I would have to follow the law. But according to our attorney, we are not. So as far as I'm concerned, the book stays in our library. I personally would like to follow what the school decision was, but it's not up to my personal feelings. They recommended it be for eighth grade. That I think is appropriate, but I represent everyone. So that's why I agree with the motion and I would not be in favor of banning the book as it stands now with the way the state law is, but I am not in favor of banning books, and I don't like that it has come up here, but I do appreciate the process, and I do appreciate everybody that put all the time into the process, because right now, that's the best we have, and we have our professionals making the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Um, so I'll go. I, um, so I, again, I appreciate the process, and I, I respect the fact that um, you know, I think about we have we have thousands and thousands upon books, um, and the process is such that I think it affords one again healthy debate. And I think this is this was very refreshing. It feels like it's been a really long time since there's been civil discussion um, with different uh, and passionate opinions. Um, but I also think there is an opportunity that if if there is a member of the community or a um, parent that has some concern, there is a mechanism, and and that goes on all sides. That that there could be something that brought was brought forward that raises an alarm, and there is now a vehicle for someone. It always has been um, for someone to bring that forward. And I shouldn't say always has been, but for as long as I've been here and quite before that, I do think that um, it's important to note that it is seldomly um, utilized. Um, I think all of us, it, as we prepared for this meeting, were, you know, and even to the timing of it, is to make sure we afforded enough time, but we haven't been through it. So it's not abused. I think that's the other part, at least that I have witnessed. And um, and this past year, again, and I'll speak from my personal experience, you know, there are certain books that other districts have had that I um, – 
that I believe largely from a grand scale, not just Bridget Ziegler, but many, many people of all different backgrounds and, and ideologies or what have you, have been in other districts, not ours, and, and um, I, I believe there's a strong backlash about that. I'm happy that that has not taken place in our school district, and I want to applaud, and I think that goes to a lot of the professionals that do very great work in Sarasota County Schools. Um, but I think of that as an example, um, and in the event that was made itself into our district, there is a mechanism for that to be challenged. And I don't want to remove that. And I want it to be removed for anybody. And there is a vetting process at the district level. I'm sorry, at the school level, the district level. And yes, that would have implications across the board. Um, and so I do understand that concern and hesitation from other families of saying, wait, I don't, I don't want uh, my child to not have access to this. And so when I look at this, I think uh, first, I, you know, the, the word book banning and censorship and, and what have you, book ban banning, I think it's overused and it's an emotional word and nobody wants to be a part of book banning. Um, but I do take the responsibility that we are tasked with, with, you know, recognizing we serve a diverse community with a, a myriad of backgrounds and um, different viewpoints and political backgrounds and religious beliefs and cultural backgrounds and being respectful to that and in a K-12 environment where we are um, tasked with the incredible responsibility of educating children of, uh, that are minor children um, versus a, um, a public library where it's not specifically narrowly tailored to students. And that does create a challenge. And so trying to cut, toe that line where you're not limiting things, but you're trying to be respectful of the age appropriateness, not making sure that there's a lot of access to a wide variety of, of content and material, but also aligning it to an age appropriate matter. And, and then what do we do when it, it's, a, it's a complex subject matter? Uh, is mentioned here, and I read it. I mean, it's a heavy book. It's, I mean, it, and I think it, it did. It was very enlightening. Um, and the question is that when we're talking about, particularly middle school, um, and I would defer to my colleague who is was an administrator of middle school for years, and um, I don't yet have middle schoolers. I'm, I'm, I feel like it's fast approaching. I'm terrified, but um, but I know that that's a challenging time, and that's a very impressionable time for children. And so, um, but again, not wanting to hamper and keep that access, I always think of it. And it's interesting. We talk about parental rights. I, I'm, I certainly talk about it all the time. Um, and this is a great example of where we, we how, do, how can we empower all parents and assure that they have a seat at the table? Because I don't, I want to make sure that that's the case. One parent's decision should not supersede another parent's decision. I've always said that. Um, and, and then yet we have the ultimate responsibility of towing that line and putting guy, you know, guardrails in place. In my mind, when it's something like this, one, one of my questions was, is this, is eighth grade appropriate? Do we have the right mechanisms in place or do we bump it up to high school? Because I absolutely think from a critical thinking component as they are developing minds at that stage, I hope that they're able and capable to, to, to handle complex um, topics. But I also respect that there are different families that want to have different conversations. But when we're talking about middle school, you know, the access limiting the access only to eighth grade, um, is that the right place for it? Or do we bump it up to high school? Alternatively, one thing that Mr. Renoff and I, I brought up was in general for all books uh, that may solve some issues here would be to have a notification process to alert parents anytime at every grade, no matter what the book, to alert parents that they have checked out a book. I think that there's multitude of benefits from an academic standpoint as a parent who is busy. Sometimes you don't know. You can engage in that discussion and it allows for uh, parents to be more involved, which we all know is valuable. In the event the parent does not want that book to be read, then they have an opportunity there to invoke that. The challenge with opt out is that's expecting every parent to have read every single book in a library and that's just not a very reasonable, rational thing. So in my mind, this is allowing and empowering parents more. I think that we do have an obligation to flag a book in the proper way so that parents can decide if we maintain where it is today. So my request would be to amend this to um, require parental consent at the time of uh, checking out the book, but it remain accessible to eighth grade. That would be my motion to amend, if there's a second. Second. So I have a motion and a second to amend the motion that it would add a parental um, consent notice in order for a student to check out this book as it remains. Um, are there any comments? Yes. Go, Mrs. Rose. Um, quite complex, and thank you for recognizing 14 years of middle school, and I did 
I was very codependent on the people that were on the committee, and I'm still codependent on you in, in what your opinion is. What I've heard uh, to, a, a lot today, and I look at uh, the first response from the middle school principal, which is huge for me because it's directly addressing um, that uh, administrator's uh, community, and, and I do understand that that school-based principal administrator was on your uh, committee as well and broadened the conversation. Um, I also look to what was successful for 14 years as a middle school administrator, and that was being um, uh, cautious with sensitivity. I think ultimately, um, you know, it, it, I looked at the way that we handled it and we had the pleasure of building a system where um, there was a lot of communication. Um, if teachers had books in their uh, classroom, they would uh, share what those books were in a syllabus, uh, back to school event, and there was a lot of open dialogue. The world has gotten a lot more complicated. And I try to look for what is the happy medium, and when I hear the age appropriateness, that, that is a hard task um, and um, bring sensitivity with it. And I only have, when it's all said and done, as a constitutional officer, uh, legal counsel to uh, lean on. And I hear there is, you know, it, it could go either way with age appropriateness. And uh, I think the answer has been to date that uh, a student, if they looked at it and couldn't understand it, they'd put back put it back on the shelf. But I'm um, all said and done uh, looking uh, to at all parties in the sensitivity, the uh, age appropriateness, and to look at um, eighth grade uh, on up, keeping it on the shelf and having the opportunity for anyone in sixth or seventh to um, absolutely have options to access the book. Thank you. Mr. Enos. Uh, the reason why I went to 6 through 12 is that I, I, lo I look at it as a, the overall from the district level that <clears throat> looked at the book, the, the, the school actually said 8th, and then the district level administrator, the, the team that came together actually said 6th and up. And when I look at something like this, is when I want to do that, is that it's impactful not just at Venice Middle School, it would be impactful at Pineview, it's impactful all the way across the board no matter where you're at. So ultimately, I believe that when you look at the consistency of Florida State statutes, you look at ultimately when you, when you bring everything to the light, obviously people's opinions when it comes to this stuff um, has to be is you only get growth from being able to have differing of opinions. Without that, you really don't have anything. So with that being said is that's why I ultimately took the overall district uh, recommendation of 6 through 12, um, again, based upon the – all the different students that obviously, as we talk about what's age appropriateness for a student that's at such and such program or at a different program, um, ultimately that's why I looked at it as saying is it should be that level across the board based upon because it impacts just not Venice Middle School, it impacts everyone. Thank you. Mr. Edwards. Yes, thank you. Um, I. I am concerned about the amendment for a, a lot of reasons. Um, I, I believe in parents' rights. I've never opposed parents' rights, and I think there are plenty um, of what has been said that the policy of, uh, of not allowing each parent or allowing a parent to restrict a book um, is the appropriate policy. When you start, um, and I appreciate Mrs. Ziegler saying that this system, this process has not been uh, abused, and once again I cite Mrs. Euchre's um, um, engagement of the discussion, which I think having a healthy discussion of opposing views is a good idea, so I'm not trying to take that away. But that amendment, um, it encourages the process um, even though it hasn't been abused, it could become abused for what we're just seeing, that anybody could challenge a book and off we go to the races and we end up back here again. And it would mean that one, one book needs to be notified that we're notifying a parent. Do we have to notify for 350 books or 2,000 books and then the librarian and every and then we have to start f trying to figure out how we get around that system. I think it's 
Um, I think we've all had a healthy discussion. I've heard, think we've all heard the opposing views, and we've gotten to a place where it's comfortable to keep it the book as it is. So I will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Um, no, I, I appreciate that. And I think that, especially as we look forward, and I'm trying to find a balancing act of where it's not going to be precluded um, so that, that as many, and I've heard many of the, and read many of the emails from many families not wanting um, that to be limited, but there are many other families that are not in support of that and would want that ab ability to chime in and say, you know, no, I don't want, this is not something I want my child to read at this time for any reason. And so it's not us infringing or overstepping, it's really empowering those families to make that decision. Um, and that way it's not eliminated from the circulation, it's just adding that to the next layer. Um, as, as certainly as I know there's a number of, of vetting of books in the future. I don't know. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of work with that. But I think, it, you know, with where I was thinking, especially as the next step, is trying to engage families in a manner that will um, balance it and support the different decisions, but also really also help staff kind of get, we have a lot, lots of focus and work to do at the, at, from the instructional level. So that really is putting parents in, a, in the driver's seat in, a, in a more of a way. So that is my motion. Um, again, I'll just to restate it is to um, require parental um, consent to check this book out while remaining still in middle school. Um, we have a motion and a second on the, f the floor. So we will do a voice vote for the amendment. We have one oh, before, didn't we? we already had a motion and a second on the first one. I amended it. So you said, well, I'll take it, a formal vote. But um, Mrs. Marinelli? Um, please oh. clarify what yeah. we're voting on. Oh, yeah. So, okay. The, my plea. So there is a motion and amendment on, to the motion on the floor. The amendment is to require parental notification for this book in it, uh, while it remains in uh, circulation at the middle school level. So we're voting on the amend. The amendment. Amended. Yes. Thank you. Is that clear? Everyone good? Okay. Mrs. Marinelli? Yes. Mr. Eno. Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Edwards? No. Uh, Mrs. Rose? Yes. Mr. Enos? No. Uh, and the chair votes aye, and the motion, the amendment passes three to two. So now the motion on the floor is to um, allow the book to remain with parental notification in middle school. And unless there are any additional comments, we can take a vote on the final motion. Any other comments? No? Okay, Mrs. Marinelli? Yes. Mr. Edwards? Yes. Mrs. Rose? I, I'm going to have to apologize. I, I'm confused. That's okay. Can you restate exactly what we're voting on? So there was an amendment that was to require parental notification. So the book stays, doesn't get taken out, but it would require parental notification to be checked out. And that passed three to two. Now that becomes the main motion so that the motion ultimately is the book titled Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism, uh, and You by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi remains in circulation in Sarasota County schools accessible in middle school with requiring parental uh, consent to be checked out. And, and yes. Okay. Mr. Enos. Yes. And the chair votes aye, and the motion passes five to zero. And just to clarify for the record, the, the motion was that the book titled Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi is to remain in Sarasota County Schools, middle schools, requiring parental consent when being checked out by a student. And that is the motion. Um, seeing no additional comments, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are calling this meeting a re, -a -re adjourning, a reconvening, excuse me, at 2 o'clock. Uh, it's 156 on um, February 7th, 2023. To, uh, at the conclusion of the book uh, hearing, there was, and my, uh, my apologies, there was misunderstanding and misquoting of the recalling the, of the motion. So, Mr., uh, Mr. Duggan, if you could please walk us through. Sure. So, I think the cleanest thing to do in light of the um ambiguity about what passed would be to call a motion to withdraw the previous vote and then to restate the motion in a more concise and clear way and then re-vote on the motion. Okay. I, I move to recall, withdraw the former motion uh, from the prior meeting. And that would need a second. I have a motion and a second to withdraw the prior motion. Um, uh, now I'll take a voice vote. 
yeah, to, to recall the prior vote regarding Thank you. the motion. I'm, I, so I move to recall the prior vote regarding the language uh, around the book titled Stamped. Is that okay? Um, are there any comments? Seeing none. Mrs. Marinelli? Yes. Mr. Edwards? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Rose? Yes. Mr. Enos? Yes. And the chair votes aye, and the uh, vote passes 5-0 to zero to recall the prior vote regarding the, bo the book stamped racism, anti-racism in you. Now, to clarify, I move that the book titled Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi remain allowable in Sarasota County schools in circulation, but is only allowed to be checked out upon parental consent prior to them taking that home. That is my motion. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, this is the... What, what type of school? Sarah, so I'm sorry, middle schools. That's how I was, well, as, as, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll work this out, thank you, but it doesn't work when we have anyone yelling. So, um, as it was stated through the committee, the recommendation was for it to remain in middle school, is that correct? That was the recommendation of the district committee, yes. Correct, so my, I'm adding on to that, my amendment for, so, is to follow the district committee's recommendation, however, to require parental consent for the students prior to their ability to check out the material, the book. And if you want to restate that so there's clarity, I apologize again. Okay. So what, what I have is a motion to permit the book stamped that we've been talking about to remain allowable in county middle schools but to only be checked out with parental consent uh, prior to uh, the book being checked out by a student. That would be my motion, yes. Is there a second? Second. Now, there's a motion to second, Mrs. Rose. Um, I just was looking for that clarification that um, it will remain uh, without parent consent. Students select in nine through 12, and the book will remain in uh, middle school six through eight, however, require uh, parent consent for checkout. Clarification to legal counsel. That is correct, right? Well, I mean, that would be for you all to decide. Um, well, that was the motion. The motion was just for parental consent. It was for the book to remain allowable in middle schools, and, but to only be checked out with parental consent prior to the student accessing the book. It was the prior motion. If you would like to clarify that to include that it would not require parental consent in the high school level, then that's fine, but you would have to do that. I don't think that was part of the motion that was originally made. May I? The committee recommendation at the district level is addressing this book, correct? Yeah, 6 through 12 at the district level. So uh, there's no additional discussion about 9 through 12 in any of the... Of the so, okay. I, just, I, I guess the, the question is, are you wanting to require parental consent at the middle school level or for the entire 6 through 12 level? I guess is a, a question that I think could be clarified as part of the motion. My motion my motion was 6 through 12, but now that you say, I mean, parental... Uh, it, was, it was through middle school. Okay. Um, however, I... I I entertain that conversation with board members as far as all the way through high school. Um, right now, it's my understanding that we have a motion on the table that would take the district's committee's recommendation um, of the book 6 through 12 and amending that to require parent consent only at middle school 6 through 8. So with the current mo uh, motion um, that would indicate that there's no parent consent required for 9 through 12, that is the current motion. Am I correct with that? I th that Translating is, That's that. my understanding of the current motion. So if you wish well, to... I, I, I'm sorry, but let's just clarify the current motion before we wish anything. Yeah, the, the prior motion, as yes. I jotted it down, was for... Uh, the book to remain in county middle schools, but only to but to require parental consent prior to a student being able to check it out. Yes. And so to me, that leaves open, you know, whether that means 
just parental consent for middle school parents or parental consent for six through 12 parents. So I think there's room to clarify that to, for the purposes of the motion. Agreed. That's where I think all the confusion has come from. So we have a motion on the table. And a second. There, was it seconded? Yes. Okay, sorry. So a motion and a second. Are there any comments? Do we have clarity on what the motion is? Mr. Duggan, can you please repeat the well, motion as what, it is right now, as not as what it is as right, it is right as now. As it is right now, as I understand it, is a motion to uh, have the book remain allowable in county middle schools, but only to be checked out with parental consent prior to the student having access to the book. That is the motion. It has been seconded. Are there any comments? Mr. Enos. Can I amend the motion to say that between 9 and 12 that there would be no parental consent in regarding to taking the book out? There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second. Can you please restate your motion for clarity, Mr. Enos? There will be... It will nope. Wait again. Here we go. Between grades 9 through 12, there will be no parental uh, consent for uh, checking this book out. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor stating that in grades nine through 12, the book stamped racism, anti-racism in you will not require parental consent in order for grades nine through 12 to check out the book. That has been a motion in a second. Is that accurate as I restate it? Yeah, so just to say the whole thing, I would say it is a motion to- Wait, we're only on the amendment. Sure, but just, okay, so the, that is an accurate reflection of the amendment, but I think it was an incomplete statement of the entire motion as a Nope, because we're only voting on the amendment, okay. so that's it. So, okay, so it's a motion and a second. Mr. Edwards. I'd like to amend the amendment uh. to say uh, that instead of um, consent, it becomes notification. You want the amendment, uh, you want to amend the amendment, which was in regards to 9 through 12, that would require no parental consent. You want to change it to no parental notification? I want the whole, anywhere the word consent is, or uh, a, a note, Mike. consent, anywhere there's the word consent, I want it changed to notification. Okay, so Mr. Enos, just to clarify, because we're on the amendment of the amendment now. So the amendment that Mr. Enos made was in reference to 9 through 12 only, and his, his uh, motion to amend the, mo to his amendment was to... Uh, require to not uh, to not require for clarification to not a double negative not require parental consent because for nine through twelve. Your motion, if it, just to clarify, your motion was to change notification to can Noti the other way around. <laughs> but and, and if I if I if I for clarity, I believe you mean that on the main motion is where you would like to change it. Anywhere on the main motion to the amendment. Right, that so this is where we'd help if we had a parliamentarian, because I know enough to get that. So understood. So what I, but that would be, so if you want to change it for the amendment on nine through twelve, restate what you want it to say for the amendment, just the amendment, the nine through twelve. Okay, so it doesn't require consent. It requ doesn't require notification. Is my change. So Mr. Enos is, and I just, I just, I think we're getting, I think what you want to do is a change on the main motion from consent to notification. That's what I believe your intent is. And so what we need to do is close out the amendment first, and then you can amend the main motion. Yes, but he's, his amendment says it doesn't require consent. So you want to say it doesn't I want, require? I want it to go from the main motion through. Well, let's do one amendment, amendment at a time. So okay. you want to say it doesn't require I think it's going to make it confusing, but. Well, we have to do amendments to the amendment. So we're talking, you're amending his, you're amending his amendment, correct? Uh -huh. That's how it is. So restate what you want it to be now that we can vote on it. Because I have to close out that one before we go to the Change his amendment. that it doesn't require consent or notification. So the motion would state in the, in the, in the affirmative, say exactly what you want, how do you want it to say? In what grades, please? Nine through twelve. Right. I, I'm not going to start language because it's going to mess sure, up. Yeah, and I'm doing my best to follow. So, as I understand, we have right now a. I'm going to talk about the motion, the first amendment, and the second amendment to make sure. And I think we need to address the first am amendment first. 
right, before we get to the Second Amendment, right? Yeah. Well, you have to deal with his – he had made a motion to amend the amendment. So now okay. we are on the so amendment. As I understand, so the amended amendment Correct. would state this. Uh, it is a motion for the book to remain allowable in middle schools and high schools, 6 through 12, uh, with uh, in the middle school level to be checked out based on parental notification – and from 9 to 12 to not be require parental notification or consent. Okay, so can I tell you how to do that? You would so we're not doing this in the right parliamentary but I'm not like I'm not a parliamentarian but that's not you have to close out the amendment. I that's why I think I understand where you're going. So if you want it to say your amendment, I just want to make sure cuz we're going to end up around again. Um you, his right now Tim has a motion an amendment that says that will clarify that there is no parental consent required for 9 through 12. You want to change that there is no uh, uh, parental notification required for 9 through 12. I want to say consent or notification. So your amendment is to say consent or notification in grades 9 through 12. Yes. Okay. Is there a second to that motion, to his amendment? Second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. And to... Would you like to restate it just to, or, or do you want me to? Yeah. I just want to make sure. So the amendment to the amendment is such that there's a motion and a second that there is no, uh, that grades 9 through 12 are, a no, sorry, that parental notification or consent is not required for the book stamped racism, anti-racism in you, and I have, uh, in grades 9 through 12. That is the motion. It has been seconded by Mr. Enos. Are there any comments? Is everyone clear? Mrs. Marinelli, vote, uh, voice vote on the amendment to the amendment. Yes. Okay, Mr. Edwards. Yes. Mrs. Rose. Yes. Mr. Enos. Yes. And the chair votes no, and the motion, the amendment to the amendment passes four to one. Now we are on the initial amendment, which is basically what Tom just said. So the uh, the poli the amendment is now um, that. The book stamped does not require parental notification or consent in grades 9 through 12. So then the main motion, Mr. Duggan, if you can now reread that back, but we would have to, I believe we'd have to vote on the amendment now in totality, even though it's a duplication. But Okay, so as I understand it, that the book stamped that we've been talking about shall remain allowable in county, I guess, middle schools and high schools, grades 6 through 12, requiring parental consent for grades six through eight, and not requiring parental consent or notification for grades nine through 12. Correct. Now, I'm sorry, we have to close out on his amendment. So basically restating almost a duplication of the vote. So we have an amendment now that's closed out for the amendment. So we have to take a voice vote for um, the add addition of, uh, on the, onto the main motion, uh, that there is no parental notification or consent um, for grades nine through 12 for stamped. That's the final amendment. So, Mrs. Marinelli. Yes. Mr. Edwards. I'm, I'm rather uh, am, I, am I in middle school or high school? <laughs> you are in high school. We're, we're closing out his, his initial amendment as now amended. So now everyone's voting. Does that go to the main motion? That's where we're at. Yes. Mrs. Rose. Yes. Mr. Enos. Yes. And the chair votes no, and the motion passes to add that, a clarification that no parental notification or consent is required in grades 9 through 12 in Sarasota County Schools when they check out the book Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism, anti and You. The motion passed 4 to 1. Now we are on the final main motion. Mr. Duggan, can you please repeat the total motion now? Sure. It is as amended and amended, I believe. Um, it is a motion for the book stamped to remain allowable in county middle and high schools from grades 6 through 12, but requiring parental consent from grade 6 through 8, but not requiring parental consent or notification for grades 9 through 12. Very good. Is there, are there any questions or comments? Mr. Edwards. I'd like to amend the motion to say that uh, it doesn't requ it re requires notification not consent for middle school. I have a motion to change consent to notification uh, for grades six uh, for middle schools, grade th six through eight. Is there a second? Uh, there is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? And your your amendment dies to no second. 
So now we are back to the main motion. Are there any questions or comments? Please repeat the main motion. Just thank you. All right, so it is a motion for the book stamped to remain allowable in middle schools and high schools, grades six through 12, requiring parental consent for grades six through eight, but not requiring parental consent or notification for grades nine through 12. Very good, any more comments, questions? Okay, we will take a voice vote. And thank you again for everyone's patience. Mrs. Marinelli. Yes. Mr. Edwards. No. Mrs. Rose. Yes. Mr. Enos. Yes. And the chair votes no, and the motion passes three to two. And to clarify, the uh, book Stamped, entitled Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi is allowable, shall, shall remain allowable in circulation in Sarasota County Middle Schools under with parental consent and allowable in Sarasota County high schools without parental consent and notification. Mr. Edward, uh, Mr. Duggan, can you just repeat that one more time just to make sure everyone's clear before I adjourn? <laughs> Give me one second. Okay, so the motion passed three to two, and the result of that motion is that the book will remain allowable in middle and high schools, grades six to 12, requiring parental consent for grades six through eight, but not requiring parental consent or notification for uh, grades nine through 12. Very good, all right. Seeing no additional comments, and I appreciate the opportunity to clarify and get it right so we didn't have to come back or any more confusion. Thank you members for your patience and members of the community. We are adjourned.